morning. Good morning, yeah. Martha. My name is Wafa Abdin again, and it is my honor to be presenting His Eminence Daniel Cardinal Bernardo. He is the Metropolitan Archbishop of Galveston, Houston, and pastor to its one, uh, more than 1.3 million Catholics uh, and 440 priests in 146 parishes and 60 schools spread over 8,880 square miles. His seats are St. Mary Cathedral Basilica in Galveston and the Cook Cathedral of the Sacred Heart in Houston. Born in Stubbonville, Ohio, and raised with three siblings in Castle Shannon near Petersburg, Cardinal Bernardo attended St. Anne Grade School and the Jesuit Ron Bishop's Latin School. Uh, he received his master's degree in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and degrees of sacred theology from both the Pontifical Gregorian University and the Patristic Institute Augustinian in Rome. You, you have to excuse my, I'm, I'm, I don't have great, you know, um, Latin, but I'm, I'm doing my best. <laughs> he was ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Petersburg on July 16, 1977, and served as parish pastor, seminary, professor, spiritual director, and in the chancery. From 1984 to 1991, he worked in Rome as a staff member for the Congregation for Bishops, as director of V.S. Bridge, the House for Americans Clergy, and as adjunct professor at the Pontifical North American College. In 1991, he returned to Petersburg, serving as pastor to several parishes, and again in the college, uh, in, uh, again in the chancery. He was appointed coadjutor bishop of Sioux City, Iowa, and ordained there as a bishop in October 1997. He was named co coadjutor bishop, later coadjutor archbishop of Galveston, Houston, in January 2004, and succeeded Archbishop Joseph Fiorenza on February 28, 2006. On June 29, 2006, he received a pallium from Pope Benedict XVI. He was elevated to the College of Cardinals in November of 2007 at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, which saw the election of Pope Francis to the See of Peter. In November of the same year, he was elected by his brother bishops as the Vice President of the United States uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops for a three-year term. And last November, he was elected as the President of the USBC. He is a member of the Pontifical Council for Culture, the Pontifical Council for the Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant People, and the Pontifical Council for the Economy and is on the Board of Trustees of the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. But he, also for us as Catholic Charities, he is really our leader, and we believe a very you know, great advocate for the rights of immigrants and refugees. So please join me in welcoming the uh, thank you very much, uh, Wafan. I'm very honored by that. I'm very honored that Dr. Kleinberg is going to trade places. I have to run to another meeting, and he will enthrall you with the data and material and substance about this city and what is going on. Um, mine is to give some uh, introductory remarks. From my point of view, as a, a local priest, shepherd, of a local church, city of Houston, Galveston, an area which is perhaps, I think Dr. Kleinberg would agree, one of the most international places in the United States with numbers of communities. We, even my own church is, is amazing at the numbers of variety of communities. I always say when they say, well this nation, they have people here that are Catholics. I say, do you know about them? I say, no, but I will soon because that's the way it happens here. People just coming in from all over. It's a remarkable city for that. By the way, it, it, she pronounced it well, coadjutor bishop. You say, what's a coadjutor? Uh, usually we have auxiliary bishops and coadjutors. The coadjutor is the guy sent in to take over eventually. And the difference between the two is the auxiliary goes into the bishop every day and says, how can I help you? The coadjutor goes in every day and says, how are you feeling today? <laughs> Does that help you understand? What going on? Okay. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference, the Center for Migration Studies, the Cabrini Center for Legal Assistance of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, the Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative, and the South Texas College of Law 
uh, for having me here today. The title for this conference, Mobilizing Coherent Community Responses to Changing Immigration Policies, is very appropriate because Houston and many other communities are attempting to respond to a new and vast array of immigration enforcement policies which are being proposed and indeed implemented. My purpose today is rather simple, to offer you some thoughts, maybe a little guidance, as you consider this topic and to communicate to you the response of the local Catholic Church, but I would say of the Catholic Church in Texas in general, uh, to recent immigration enforcement initiatives. First, let me lay out for you the position of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, of which I serve as president, on the issue of immigration. Our position is based upon scripture and decades of Catholic social teaching that come from uh, the Holy See, from the popes, and even from ourselves as a collective of bishops in the United States. Jesus himself was an itinerant preacher, at least at some level. In the Gospel of Matthew, the author of Matthew says, he had no place to lay his head. We also know from the Gospel of Matthew that he was a refugee. If you look to the Holy Family, they had to flee to go to Egypt when Herod sought him. Thus Christ himself experienced the feeling of leaving one's homeland or of living from day to day, not really knowing where he might sleep that night. He taught us to welcome the stranger uh, because in doing so we are serving him. And in that line of welcoming the stranger, he brought on the whole issues of the Jewish scriptures, which are so intense, on the, the stranger and the alien, or the widow and the orphan. I might add in light of this that um, at one point, a lawyer, and this is nothing against lawyer, we're in a nice law school here, <laughs> but a lawyer in the Gospel of St. Luke, and you know, St. Luke's Gospel is extremely sensitive to issues of people on the margins. And at one point, uh, someone asked, a lawyer asked him, uh, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus answers, quoting Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But St. Luke remembers the lawyer asking a nasty question. Who's my neighbor? Jesus does not wag his finger at him. He tells him a story, a parable. And the parable is the Good Samaritan. You may know it, some of you, that a man is going down from Houston to Galveston, right? He falls <laughs> among robbers. <laughs> there's a, uh, there's a uh, what he calls the, the Jewish priest, sees the man at the side of the road almost dead, might be touching a corpse and thus remain ritually unclean, passes by. Same with a Levite. But a Samaritan who was not well loved in the Jewish community at the time, sees him, has pity, picks him up, puts him in his car, takes him to the Holiday Inn, you know, takes care of him. When Jesus finishes the parable, he looks at the lawyer and does not answer the lawyer's question. He asks another question. Who was neighbor to the man who fell among thieves? And the lawyer is forced to say, well, I guess the one who helped him. And Jesus says, duh, go <laughs> do the same, <laughs> right? It really changes the issue, doesn't it? And some people ask us, why are you such do-gooders, you bishops on this? We're do-gooders. We're responding in principles to something Jesus put in principle. You never ask the question, who's my neighbor? Who's good enough to be my neighbor? What's the question you raise? Who are you neighbor to? Who are you neighbor to? Thus, it's a pretty significant issue. First, uh, the issue of immigration is an institutional issue for us as Catholics. Because immigrants are a part of the fabric of our life, they're ever present in our parishes, schools, social service programs, healthcare facilities, and other ministries. When I go to the various parishes, I have 150 in the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. Some of our parishes have as many as eight to 9,000 families. So they're huge. And when you look out over the congregation, which I think is beautiful, every face is a face of a distinctive community in the world. It's the beautiful part of the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. We are international. And of course, this creates issues, problems. But it also reminds us uh, of what's happening in the United States. It certainly is happening here. I can't speak for the rest of the country, but it certainly is happening here. We are an immigrant church. Um, our church has grown with the nation with successive waves of immigrants. Immigrants accounted for just 1% of the population in the original 13 colonies, but now they constitute 14% of the nation's population, probably at least. 
to adopt the phrase, immigrants are us. That's who we are. So the Catholic Church in the United States has a strong interest in the issue of immigration and how immigrants are treated regardless of their legal status, as we all have God-given human rights to life and to an opportunity to live our lives in security and freedom. In fact, in some of the things that have happened in recent months, even within the great state of Texas, where we have uh, possibilities of police, you know, having to ask questions and all. I only have anecdotal information, sisters and brothers, but we have little kids, you know. We have inner city Catholic schools, and they're going in there, and they're crying because mommy and daddy are going to be home tonight. It's absurd why that should happen. You say it's only anecdotes. I agree. But anxiety is not a way to live. There has to be another way in which we deal with this. Pope Francis has made migration one of the signature issues of his four-year papacy. Opposing the globalization of indifference, is the way he phrases it, to the plight of immigrants, migrants, and refugees, and deploring what he calls the throwaway culture in which we all live today. It leads us to discard people because they may look differently, speak differently, or follow a different faith and culture. As the Holy Father said to the United States Congress in September of 2015, and I can say I was there, so I know what he said, <laughs> we must welcome people in a way which is always just and fraternal. We need to avoid a common temptation nowadays is to discard whatever proves troublesome. Pope Francis has also said that migrants are not pawns on the chessboard of humanity. In other words, migrants both in this country and globally are often used for their labor but are not given protections in the workplace or allowed to participate fully in their communities. Despite filling important jobs, we frequently scapegoat them for our social ills and ignore their contributions to our economy and culture. This is the moral issue confronting us in the United States and around the world. How migrants are used for their sweat equity and then discarded when convenient. And let me make this further se sentence. Both the sending countries and the receiving countries benefit from this system. As undocumented immigrants who contribute to their host country also send back remittances to their source country but are not protected in transit or upon arrival. So for us as a moral matter, who is our neighbor? Who are you neighbor to? We think this system must change. What is the prescription of our bishops conference for fixing a broken system? We've been advocating in Congress for the last 40 years, lest anybody thinks uh, we in the Catholic Church are new to the scene. We've been dealing with this for 40 years. Broad immigration reform must be passed, whereby undocumented immigrants who have built equities in our country and have been otherwise law-abiding are put on a path to citizenship. <coughs> Instead of deporting such peop people, we should allow them a chance to get on the right side of the law so they can fully contribute their skills and gifts to our society. We also need to increase the legal avenue for immigrants and families to migrate in a safe and orderly manner. Unfortunately, we are seeing immigration and refugee policies in this country go in the opposite direction, with a renewed emphasis on enforcement-only measures, including requiring local law enforcement and social jurisdictions uh, to enforce immigration laws to the detriment of the safety of all of us. When you pass certain laws that require the police that they may ask somebody about their immigration status, uh, if something goes wrong where they get attacked, they won't, they won't talk to the police. You know, in our own city, we're trying very hard to have the police and immigrant communities get along. And th this, does, this kind of thing just doesn't help matters. Um, we believe that these proposals uh, do little to fix our immigration and in the end will drive persons further underground and isolated. They also will increase the separation of families, parents from their US citizens' children, and thus weaken the social fabric in our communities and cause damage to innocent children. By the way, if I could do something practical here, if uh, you are in any fashion in parishes or communities or in neighborhoods and, and you have um, uh, children who are U.S. citizens, whatever may be the status of their parents, uh, make sure they can get passports. Sounds odd, doesn't it? Get them passports. That's not unimportant. We are witnessing the creation of a climate of fear in our nation, a fear we should reject and replace with inclusion and security. We have to bring people out of the darkness and shadows. Let me be clear, however, Catholic teaching does support the right of a sovereign nation to ensure the integrity of its borders and to enforce its laws. We object, however, when laws and policies fail to respect human rights or fail to ensure due process in the justice system. 
if you want to talk to a bishop who knows all about this, talk to the Bishop of Brownsville, Texas, Bishop Daniel Flores. He'll tell you all about the um, due process problems that are at our borders, even in Texas. Often the U.S. immigration system does not meet this test. It is beset by the absence of legal representation, the lack of sufficient immigration judges, reliance on large-scale detention, and administrative processes which do not involve an objective adjudicator. Along our border, we support the role of the Border Patrol who occasionally save the lives of immigrants caught in the desert. However, we are concerned with border politics in which some of our elected officials continue to push increased enforcement measures, including the construction of a border wall, which will prove ultimately to be expensive, ineffective, and lead to immigrants taking more dangerous routes to enter the country. The term secure the border is, can be used, but it is often a rallying cry to prevent the passage of necessary reform of our laws, despite the fact that border crossings are down significantly right now. Instead of a wall, Pope Francis says we should build bridges. Over the long term, we must do what we can to address the root causes of flight. Poverty, violence, and climate change. Issues in the home countries, we should work on them. I'm all in favor of doing that so people don't have to leave. But people can exercise their right to remain in their home countries and live in safety. But in the short term, we need to improve our legal immigration system so that the low skilled can enter and can work legally. We also need to oppose efforts to change our local law enforcement officials who work long hours to protect our communities with the responsibility, in addition to law, of enforcing immigration law. It would fundamentally alter the relationship of our local law enforcement officials that they maintain with their local communities, especially immigrant communities, in order to identify and pursue those who are a threat to our society. This does not prevent local enforcement authorities from collaborating with federal agencies to hand over violent criminal aliens. But it does relieve them of the burden of pursuing those who are otherwise law-abiding, thus taking away from their efforts to ensure public safety. It also makes immigrant communities reluctant to report crimes and cooperate with the police, which is one of our issues, some of our local communities here in Houston. SB 4, which was recently signed into law in Texas, would impose such a burden upon the police officials and over the long term will weaken and not strengthen public safety. By requiring jurisdictions in Texas to act as immigration agents, the law would create fear in immigrant communities throughout Texas and divert police attention from their primary mission to protect the general public. I want to commend Sheriff Acevedo, other law enforcement officials, for their position on this issue. In our view, bringing undocumented immigrants out of the shadows, registering them, and giving them legal standing with a chance for citizenship would separate them from those who are a threat Comprehensive reform is pro-security. I suppose that polls have shown such a solution, by the way, has the majority support of the American public. <coughs> I would also like to reinforce the position of our church that is part of our faith and is our honored heritage as a nation. We must continue to protect those who ask for our protection from persecution in their homeland. Retreating from this moral obligation not only undermines our nation's mor moral authority globally, it weakens the global refugee protection system, as other nations may also retreat from their obligations. We also must protect those who are persecuted because of their faith, all forms of religious minorities who suffer violence, and that, of course, includes Christians. As the world's richest nation, we are able to resettle far more than 50,000 refugees a year, all of whom are themselves fleeing some terror or violence. As many of you may know, the security process for vetting refugees is more stringent than any other entrance into the United States, lasting as long as two years in some cases. As a nation, we can ensure our security without sacrificing our humanity. May I add that Houston, I think, I, has the largest number of refugees around the, the country. We're pretty good at that here. Just south of us, we are witnessing a humanitarian crisis in the Northern Triangle of Central America, in which unaccompanied minors and family units are fleeing gang violence in their country. We must not respond to this outflow with purely deterrence policies marked by family detention, interdiction, the lack of due process. Instead, we must respond with protection policies to ensure that those who are at risk, especially the vulnerable, are not returned to danger. This is our responsibility under international agreements to our, human, our fellow human beings. Sisters and brothers, we are at a crossroads in our nation's history 
one in which we can choose to remain the leader in upholding humanitarian values in our nation and around the world, or one in which we abdicate our moral responsibility and our global leadership in protecting human rights. Much of our power as a nation comes from our commitment to the rule of law and to opportunities in which all are judged equally and have a chance at their God-given potential. Pope Francis, in his speech to our Congress last two years ago, said the best policy is to follow the golden rule, which in the end will help build peace and security. In a word, if we want security, let us give security. If we want life, let us give life. I commend all of you for your commitment to the most vulnerable among us, those most in need of advocacy and support. And I pledge my support, support of you as Bishop, in protecting the rights of all immigrants and refugees, especially during challenging times. Thank you so much for listening to my remarks. Thanks. By the way, friends, through our uh, Bishops' Conference in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, we've come up with a, uh, uh, a holy card. That's Our Lady of Guadalupe. But on the holy card is, what do you say to an immigration official? In English and Spanish. And it gives points like, I do not wish to speak with you, answer your questions, sign or hand on to you any documents based on my Fifth Amendment rights under the U.S. Constitution. Mm -hmm. And Cosi and Cosi, so forth and so forth. It's a marvelous little practical invention. You give it out in your parishes. You know, and you find a way in which people are thereby reassured. We have a number of these kind of things. And, uh, I mean, and lots of groups are doing this, by the way. I know in lots of Christian communities, other communities are doing it to help the local immigrants. But uh, the Bishop's Conference has come up with some really interesting ways to practically help as well as doing the kind of work you have to do that you do in uh, advocacy work. Thanks. Uh, I, I was hoping if you can take two or three questions, we would greatly appreciate it. We need the data from Dr. Kleinberg. <laughs> it's all quiet on the Western side. No questions? No questions. Thanks. I, th I think we have uh, one. We have one. Just question. Good morning, Cardinal. Uh, I'm Pancho Arguelles. I'm here with Living Hope Wheelchair Association, which is a group of, uh, I'm here with Living Hope Wheelchair Association. Uh -huh. are, they are there, my brothers. And we are a group that has been able to exist because of the support of CCHD nationwide. Oh. So we want to say thank you. And we also are, are wondering, in these times of crisis, with all the history, the tradition that the Catholic Church has uh, lifting their voice for, for immigrants, what other things you think the local parishes could do to transform uh, their ministries or like maybe become other places for organizing? Like what else could be done in, in these time, times of, of, of crisis? Well, the, the first thing I'll say is the most simple. We have immigrants, people in your parishes, welcome them. Don't keep them at the margins of your parish. Some of them will come. As you know, we, we have parishes that have lots of immigrant families, but they won't register for anything. You know why. They're afraid to register for anything. And they just won't register. So they need to be welcomed, to my mind. And, and welcoming means more than just saying hello and say it's nice you came to church today. You have to kind of in include them into the parish's life. And they're going to be reticent at first, right? They are. So it, it, this has to be done more repeatedly. I would say that's a practical thing that's very important. You can also work with a, a, a local diocese, you know, in doing uh, 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 a advocacy. Some of our parishes work with other Christian and uh, religious communities in a given area of the city. Uh, that's where the CCHD stuff comes in. To, to deal with uh, local issues in the, in the area to help the communities. I think that's an important thing to do. By the way, I'm very proud of CCHD. That's the Catholic Campaign for Human Development. There's a collection every year, and it uh, helps to the groups that kind of help immigrants, all kinds of other things. It's all for the poor. Now, I can say this, you know, I'm very proud of the Archdiocese. This is a controversial collection, has been for the last 30 years. But it's the highest amount for a second collection uh, in the Archdiocese of Galveston history. Our people are incredibly generous to us. And that's how we can do some things that we can take as well. So 
That's great. Those are some thoughts I had there. I mean, the rock's on my mind. But that's fine. Thanks, Paul. Yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. Uh, another quick question, Father. Uh, how much effort is the Catholic Church making to lobby the administration to change the policies of the Pope? Um, we, um, we lobby consistently, this administration. Uh, frequently, though, it is difficult. Uh, the, there, there are, I say it this way, there are two groups around the president. The outer group, you really can speak to, even on issues like immigration. They don't always agree with you, but you can speak with them. And then there's the inner group, and the inner circle is impenetrable, Dr. Brown. I, mean, I, can, I, I can say that. So, Stephen, I just think we have to keep going. We agree with Pope Francis. You just keep, you just keep doing it. We have written to Congress. We have written to representatives. We, we, we write and deal all the time, and we have some good people, but so do the Lutherans, Presbyterians. I mean, all the religious groups are working. I think we have to just keep up our efforts. It seems like it's like Sisyphus going up the mountain, but I, I think we're making some progress. The very fact that there are some people uh, in Congress who are uh, Republicans who are saying, yeah, we can't just deal only with security. I'm saying that's first, but we have to do something is, is a great step. Yes. Good uh, morning, Cardinal. Uh, so my name is Carlos Duarte. I'm the state director for Mi Familia Vota, and we are a nonpartisan organization, and we're trying to encourage people to, to get out and vote. Uh, when, I, when I talk to people uh, about coming out and voting, uh, Catholics particularly, and I was raised Catholic, uh, always they come back to the notion of, you know, I actually like the position that certain party has regarding, uh, you know, immigration, but what good does it make for us to create this uh, wonderful country if I'm losing my soul by, by not voting for people that are against abortion? And I just want to put at the outset that um, obviously, I, I haven't ever met anyone that promotes abortion, so uh -huh. I think that the discussion is much more sophisticated than that. But, but in the mind of, of, of some voters, it just comes down to that. So how can we get people to transcend that uh, limited uh, interpretation of, of politics so that they can participate and, and, and actually uh -huh. vote? That, that sure. Thing? Part of it is to try to get the, uh, <laughs> say this, to get members of the, uh, the people who are pro-immigration to not be so... Uh, so tough on being pro-choice and pro-abortion. Part of it is, you know, uh, I've often said myself, and it's, this is pr purely personal, um, uh, we didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left us over some of these issues. There's a way you can deal with this that's, because we, we are very favorable, as you know, to the immigration stuff. We, we, we want to see this happen. and we, uh, But uh, we are, we're non-negotiable on the importance of the pro-life issue. That's just the way we are. We're never going to change that for it. Uh, but we can be equally, that's a, it's a pro-life issue to deal with immigration is the way we try to talk about it. To be pro-immigration uh, is to be pro-life. Now, there are lots of Catholics who are opposed to the bishops on this. I wouldn't, I'm not Pollyannish about this. We have to do lots of persuasion. We went up to a suburb here in north of Houston where the people were very much, you know, they weren't so good on immigration. We did some, some groups, small groups. We did some work in the parish. We did bulletin stuff. We did some one or two homilies. And it, it partially, uh, softened the hearts of those on uh, voting for the pro-immigration stuff. It's just hard work, to, that's all I can tell you. I wish I could tell you, oh yes, there's an easy solution. I don't think there is, but uh, we're still gonna fight for the pro-life cause of immigration. That's for us. We have one more question. Uh, yeah. Okay, good morning, Your Eminence. Good morning, Hi. everyone. Uh, I'm a Catholic, and I also live in North Texas. I'm an organizer with Faith in Texas. Okay. And so my charge are the Catholic Church. So at the local level, how do we elevate the urgency for our parish to be responsive and to be vocal, or to even be supportive of the social justice teachings that the sure. our Pope? Sure. Do you work with your do. diocese, your local diocese? So we work with some with the diocese, but mm -hmm. where the challenge is is to have the vocal support more so in our local parishes. Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes you have to get the diocese to work with the local parish yeah. to persuade them parish. more. There are going to be people who are going to be opposed when you do this. There's no question. Do you, how about working with the uh, parish clergy, with the shepherds, the priests involved, or the deacons? We get some good, re good work if we get our, our deacons involved at the parish level. Again, we're such a huge archdiocese, so I don't know. You may, you may be smaller. They don't have the same numbers. Uh, but it is an uphill fight, even amongst some of our own people, to get them to realize that this isn't a significant, this is a significant issue. That's where we're at in the church. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me. I think you have to keep working at it. Um, you need the cooperation of the diocesan officials. So when you go to a parish, say, 
it's, we're saying, you know, we're working on this, but we're doing it in light of our own church's teaching and what we think is so important. That's a tough job. I, I'm, I'm not, I wish I had a major solution, even in this big place. We've got pockets in our own diocese that are you know, not so good on this. So I get the honor of uh, introducing our, our local celebrity uh, statistician and demographer. I don't know how many other regions have uh, such a celebrity. Uh, Dr. Kleinberg gave me a, a little introduction paragraph, very tiny. Uh, I, I don't think it really deserves <laughs> uh, everything. I actually looked up his CV, which is about 25 pages long. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase some of the things on here. Uh, his bachelor's out of Haverford. Master's at the University of Paris, uh, PhD at Harvard. Uh, he started his teaching career at, uh, at Princeton, at, 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 sorry, at Harvard and then at Princeton uh, before coming to Rice where he's been here since uh, 1972, so really a Houston institution. Um, his claim to fame, of course, for, for those who are from Houston, is the Houston Area Survey, and, and that's what he's going to be talking about. So uh, without further ado, Dr. Kleinberg. Thank you. Delighted to be here and, and share what all of us are, are thinking about, about how do we deal with this remarkable moment in the history of Houston and America as we move to try to build a world that can work in the 21st century. Houston is at the forefront of these fundamental changes. And you know, we, uh, we did a one-time survey back in 1982. Houston was booming. Angles were pouring into the city from everywhere else in the country. This is where the jobs were. 82% of the jobs in Houston in 1980 were tied into the price of oil. We were a one-company town riding the oil boom, increased tenfold in value during 1970s. This was boom town America. We did a one-time survey to measure how are people yeah, balancing yeah, this yeah. growth with growing concerns about traffic, pollution, crime. Houston was world famous as a city that had imposed the least amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. Who cares if it's ugly? So what if it smells? It's a smell of money. Come on down. So we did a one-time survey to measure the social cost of growth. Never occurred to us to do it again. Two months later, in May of 1982, the oil boom collapsed. Houston went into major recession, the worst regional recession yeah. of any part yes. of the country at any time since World War II, and then a recovery into a restructured economy and a demographic revolution. So I want to just remind us of, of what these are, are looking like and how they have fundamentally transformed who we are and what is happening in our world as the 21st century unfolds. The new economy. Here is the 30 years after World War II. The United States emerged out of that war, the sole economic power on the planet. All of our potential competitors were decimated by the war experience. Okay. And uh, the rising tide lifted all boats. And the reason why this is so important to recognize is that this is the world that so many of us still think we live in, a world of opportunity for anybody. The average American man, whatever his job was between 1950 and 1970, literally doubled his income making more money every year. And in those were the years when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman between 1946 and 1964 gave birth to 3.6 children on average. And the baby boom was launched upon the land, preceded and followed by baby bus generations. So for 60 years, it's been this bulge going through the American system. Demographers talk about it like a pig being swallowed by a python. Not very comfortable either for the pig or the python. The leading edge of those 76 million babies, overwhelmingly, of course, Anglo babies. That's who was here to be born in that period after World War II. The leading edge of those 76 million turned 71 this year. And we are going to watch a literal doubling of the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. Every single day between now and 2030, day after day, 10,000 Americans will turn 65. And by 2030, the youngest of those 76 million will have turned 65, heading off into the proverbial sunset, being replaced by a very different generation of Americans. It is a fundamental, remarkable transformation. I want to illustrate that for you in just a second. Here is the 35 years after World War II. I'm sorry, 35 years. The most recent 35 years after 1980, in essence. And almost all the benefits of growth have gone to the richest 5%. Most of that was which is 1%. The poorest 60% of American families have basically stagnated over the last 35 years. Why? What happened? Why is it the rising tide lifting all boats? Two big answers. Number one, globalization. 
Companies can produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you're doing a job that I can train a third world worker to do and I pay that third world worker $15 a day in Mexico or somewhere, I'm not gonna pay you $15 an hour. And if you are doing a job that I can program a computer to do, I will soon be replacing your job with an intelligent machine. We are in a new world where education, always a nice thing to have, has become absolutely essential to a person's ability to earn enough money to support a family in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century. The critical challenge is, as we absorb the new immigrants coming, many with very low levels of education, is to find ways to ensure that they can succeed in school and, uh, and, and be prepared for the jobs of the 21st century. Here's one piece of evidence for what we're talking about. In 1973, there were 91 million jobs in this country. Of all those 91 million jobs in the 1970s, one third you were eligible for as a high school dropout. Another 40% required no more than high school. 75% of all the jobs in America in the 1970s during that period of, of, of broad-based economic prosperity, plenty of good jobs, 38% of the jobs were union jobs, negotiating with, with, the, with the companies to ensure that workers shared in the prosperity of the, of the corporation. 75% of the jobs required no more than high school. Here are the jobs more recently, and by 2020, they tell us 65% of all the jobs that will exist in America will require education beyond high school. Not necessarily four years of college, but one or two years of a community college. And it's a part of the new reality of the 21st century. So theme number one, growing inequalities across America, particularly clear in cities like Houston, predicated above all else on access to quality education. One quick example is one of the, one of the moments of truth in, in public education is third grade reading. If you're not reading at third grade level in third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the single most powerful predictor of whether you can read at third grade level is did you start kindergarten ready to learn to read? And rich kids start kindergarten one and a half to two years ahead of poor kids. And that gap continues to expand and it is a big part of the central challenge for Houston in America in the 21st century. The other great theme, of course, is this irreversible transformation in the ethnic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. Why here, why now, how, what's been happening in Houston, how we responded to it. Here's a quick reminder of the, of the history of America. This is uh, the number of immigrants coming to America in each of the decades of the 1820s to the 2000s. The big fundamental story of our lifetimes is that between 1492 and 1965, 82% of all the human beings on the face of this planet who came to American shores, 82% came from Europe. Another 12% were Africans originally brought here as slaves to serve the Europeans. There was a handful of Chinese and Japanese working as farmers and laborers in California and Hawaii. This nation throughout its entire history has been an amalgam of European nationalities, deliberately so. We were operating in the last 40 years of that period, between 1924 and 1965, under one of the most viciously racist laws the U.S. Congress ever passed, the National Origins, uh, the, the National Origins Quota Act that came out of the great anti-immigrant racist backlash that accompanied the last great wave of immigration when 15.9 million immigrants came to America between 1890 and 1914, coming from Europe, but not coming from Northern Europe. They were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, and they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews, and they had no history of democracy, coming to take our jobs and destroy our country. We've gotta stop them. And in 1924, we enacted this incredible act that said only Northern Europeans from now on would be allowed to come to America. The, the, you can see what happened to immigration. The, it plummets, that's of course the Great Depression in the 1930s, followed by World War II and the terrible aftermath of World War II. We thought immigration had ended. The law could not survive the shifts of consciousness with the civil rights movements, Kennedy's assassination. Jack Kennedy was one of the great champions of immigration. The last book written after he was, was assassinated uh, was, was called A Nation of Immigrants, a celebration of how much immigration is brought to America. And partly in tribute to him, we changed the law saying, nothing's gonna change, immigration is over, but we're, not, we're gonna get this embarrassing law off the books, and everything changed. During the 1960s, three and a half million immigrants came to this country, only 38% were from Europe. 1970s, five million came, only 18% were Europeans. 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, 10 million immigrants per decade have been coming to America, 88% coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. And the United States, that throughout all of our history had been an amalgam of European nationalities, is rapidly becoming a microcosm of the world. The first nation in the history of the world that can say we are a free people and we come from everywhere. 
It's a truly remarkable change. I mean, the same moment as American economy is becoming fully integrated in the single global world economic system. America now a microcosm of all the world's peoples, of all the world's religions. Immigration, of course, is network driven, so it's not happening at the same rate everywhere in the country. The, 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 the big immigration capital is still New York City in terms of sheer numbers, followed by Los Angeles, Miami, and Chicago, followed right after Chicago by Houston, San Diego, San Francisco, Dallas, Boston, Atlanta, spreading out to every city and town across America. No city has been transformed as fully, as completely, as suddenly, as irreversibly as Houston, Texas. This city throughout all of our history was a biracial southern city dominated and controlled in an auto automatic, take it for granted way by white men. And in the space of the last 35 years, it's become the single most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the entire country. Here are the census figures for the three decades of the oil boom years. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll show you. In 1960, we were 78% seven, of us were Anglos, 20% African Americans, 6% Hispanics, less than one half of 1% were Asians. Anglos pointed, by 1980, we become the fourth largest city in America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo city, 63% Anglo, 20% African American, 16% Hispanic, 2% Asian. After 1982, that fateful date in the history of Houston, the Anglo population of Harris County stopped growing. And all the growth of this, the most rapidly growing city in America, all the growth of the last 35 years has been the influx of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. Here are the last, uh, the, 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 the last three and a half decades, 1990, 2000, 2010, and the most recent estimates, we are now 42% Latino, 32% Anglo, 18% African American, 8% Asian. Truly remarkable, right? And See what happened to Anglos, the percentage of Anglos has dropped, that number, that sheer number of Anglos has dropped in Harris County. Har African American population keeping pace with the population as a whole, fueled by African migration, fueled by the great remigration of middle class African Americans who are going to northern cities, coming back to southern cities, Atlanta first, Houston second. African American population keeping pace and surging populations of Latinos and Asians. So two big points to make here. Number one, just imagine how different the story of Houston would have been had we not become one of the ma great magnets for the new immigration of the last 30 years. Houston would have lost population. We would have had the same fate as other major American cities across the country that are losing their status as major cities because for 35 years they have stopped growing. Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Instead, Houston is one of the most vibrant, rapidly growing cities in America, tremendous entrepreneurial economy, Last city going into recession, the first one to come out purely because of the tremendous energy, vitality, commitment to hard work of immigrants pouring into the city from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. No city has benefited more from immigration than Houston, Texas. And it's ironic, but I guess not surprising, as I'll show you in a minute if we have time, uh, of the, the, the anti-immigrant attitudes in this city. When you think how different the story would have been had we not had remained as we were in 1980, like Philadelphia, for one reason or another, Philadelphia never became the Houston has been for the urban growth of America in the 21st century. And the other point to make is this remarkable uh, 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 evenness, the coming together of the four communities in America. I think my next slide shows that. Here are the eight most diverse large metropolitan areas in the country. This is why we make the claim that Houston is the most ethnically diverse city in, the, in America, is the main measure is how close does a population come to one-fourth Asian, one-fourth Latino, one-fourth African American, one-fourth Anglo how ethnically diverse this is called the entropy index. And by that measure, Houston is the most diverse in the entire country. So here is the uh, greater Houston metropolitan area of the census of 2010. You can see that division among the four groups. The single most ethnically diverse county on the planet, we believe, is Fort Bend County. Fort Bend County today is 20% Asian, 24% Latino, 21% African American, 34% can't get much closer to one-fourth, one-fourth, one-fourth than that. So here, we beat out New York because New York has too many Anglos. We beat out Los Angeles because there's too few African Americans. We beat out uh, Miami, of course, because there's virtually no Asians. We beat out San Francisco because they have very few Hispanics. This is where the four communities meet in greater balance, greater equality. All of us minorities, all of us called on to build something that has never existed before in human history truly successful, inclusive, equitable, united, multi-ethnic society made up of all the peoples, of all the religions of the entire planet. 
And this will be Houston and Texas and America as the 21st century unfolds. We are there first. Uh, here's another way to, to envision this very quickly. This is Harris County in 1980. There are 1,340 census tracts in Harris County. In blue are all the census tracts that had majority Anglo populations in the census of 1980. In red are the census tracts with majority African American. That's basically the third ward and the fifth ward, the hyper segregation of blacks in the inner city of Houston, this African American corridor. And then along the ship channel was the second ward, the Segundo Barrio, where the Latinos were and then a few places around the Beltway in that olive color with no majority. That's Harris County in 1980, here's 1990. Surging population of Latinos heading north and east, more and more uh, uh, census tracts with no majority. Here it is in 2000 and here it is in 2010. Isn't that incredible? With no one having planned this, no one consulted with me before all these people came. Houston finds itself at the forefront of the demographic transformation occurring across all of America we are there first. And it's not just numbers, of course, it's also ages. So here is, uh, I've got babies on the left and old people on the right. I've got 12 different age categories from under the age of five to 75 years old or older. And here, somewhat to my chagrin, is where the angles are in Harris County, Texas. Harris County, right, not HISD, not inner city Houston, the six and a half, of, I'm sorry, four and a half million people who live in Harris County. Leanne, welcome to the baby boom. It is not until you reach people in Harris County today, age 63 and older, that the majority of folks are still Anglos. And at each younger age group, the percentage of Anglos plummets, the percentage of African Americans, Asians, and above all Latinos surges. Here's where everybody else is in Harris County, Texas today. So this is a powerful picture of Houston's present and future of everybody all the 1.9 million kids in Harris, in Harris County, Texas, under the age of 20, age 19 and younger, of all of those kids, 51% are Latinos, 19% are African Americans, 9% are Asians, 22% are Anglos, of everybody under the age of 20. So two big points to make. Number one, 70% of everybody, of all the young people in Harris County, are African-American and Latino, the two groups overwhelmingly the most likely to be living in poverty. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools. It is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African-American Latino young people are unprepared to succeed in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is difficult to envision a prosperous future for Houston. That is who we are and will be as the 21st century unfolds. And the other point to make is that this is a done, a done deal. Close the borders, build your fence, close off America, round up those 10 million people you think are here illegally, send them wherever you think they're supposed to go. 63-year-old Anglos are not gonna be making a whole lot more babies. <laughs> we'll do the best we can, we'll keep working on it. <laughs> so I, I tell people, you know, we can go to the bank on this. No conceivable force in the world is gonna stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more African American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. Nothing in the world can stop that. So the only question our generation's been given is, okay, how do we make this work? How do we ensure that this diversity becomes a tremendous asset we can be, we can position ourselves in the global economy, second largest port in the country, the sixth largest port in the world, the gateway to the global marketplace, and make sure it doesn't end up tearing us apart and becoming a major liability, reducing rather than enhancing our competitiveness in the global economy, much depends on how this generation speaks to this remarkable convergence of the two forces that have transformed the 21st century, a new economy where education is now critical, and a demographic revolution. So this is Houston, here is America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo country, but the same pattern, right? This is the story of our, of our lives, it's the aging of the Anglo baby boom that is and, and the replacement of the Anglo baby boom with a millennial generation made up of all the world's peoples. Uh, s about three months after the census gave us this data, they said, okay, now all of our estimates from our, our, our intervening censuses that we do between, between the decades, of everybody across the entire country of America under the age of eight, the majority, we think, are now African American, Latino, and Asian. And he said, you wanna know what America will look like in 2030, or I'm sorry, in 2050, uh, here's what America looks like. 
security. Let's assume no immigration. So minimum, min the most conservative estimate, and just go by those damn actuarial tables that those of my age no longer like to read too, too heavily on. Here is what America looks like in 2050. So that's very close to Houston and Texas together. And it really is fair to say how we navigate this transition will have enormous significance, not just for the Houston future, but for the American future. This is where, for better or worse, the American future is going to be worked out. And it's what makes, I think, all of our efforts and commitments and, uh, are of transcendent importance, because it's not just Houston we're talking about here. We're talking about where, where, where all of America, all of America will look like Houston looks today in about 25 years. We are there first. How we navigate this transition will have enormous significance. Uh, this is a bifurcated immigration stream. Asian immigrants are coming with extraordinary credentials and education. 40% of, of U.S.-born Anglos have, have uh, I'm sorry, 40% yeah, of U.S.-born Anglos have college degrees. Among U.S.-born blacks, about one-fifth are high school dropouts, one-fifth are college degrees. One-fourth of, of U.S.-born Latinos are high school dropouts, one-fifth are college degrees. And Latino immigrants are coming with striking educational deficits. And that's what scares people, that all these Latinos coming with very little education, making these demands on our resources, never getting out of poverty, never learning English. So we can contribute to this discussion because we have reached in our surveys over 5,000 U.S.-born Latinos and 4,800 Latino immigrants. So we can ask the question, what happens to Latino immigrants who've been in the United States for nine years or less, 10 to 19 years, 20 years or longer, compare them to second generation Latinos born in America of immigrant parents and third generation born in the United States of parents who were also born in America. And here again, as quickly as I can, are the, uh, the the measures, uh, anyone getting any kind of college education beyond high school, virtually no change because the Latino immigrants come here largely as adults, but strikingly and ominously no improvement from second generation to third generation Latinos. Third generation Latinos are having no more success than second generation in getting into college, are finding that colleges have increased th three times in the cost of, of access and a whole range of things that make that a central part of the Houston the questions of the Houston future, but meanwhile, without any improvement in education, they are clearly improving in their uh, getting out of, of uh, the, those unskilled day labor jobs. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump over. Personal earnings are more than 25,000. Go up the longer you're here in this country. Uh, some other measures, do you own or rent the place where you live? Do you and your family currently have any health insurance? Do you have access to the internet in your home or place of business? As you watch Latino immigrants coming with very low levels of education, they are working their way out of poverty, at least as fast as the Italians and the Greeks and the Poles did 100 years ago when the same concerns were being expressed about them. How is that possible? And this, uh, friends over at the uh, School of Public Health studying something they call the Hispanic Immigrant Paradox. The paradox has something to do with this. The uh, Latina women in abject poverty coming into the area hospitals and giving birth to perfect babies, 100% full-term healthy babies, whereas African-American women in similar circumstances have large numbers of low birth weight babies with serious problems. How is that possible? The Hispanic immigrant paradox. And their conclusion is the great American story. Who braves the journey? Who undertakes to overcome all the obstacles we put in the way of people who are trying to get here? Only the healthiest, only the most self-confident, only the most committed to the belief, if you work hard in a city like Houston, you can make it. And that replenishing of the American spirit, that experience of, and is of, of recognizing that this is not a random sample of Mexicans, just as it was not 100 years ago, a random sample of Italians and Greeks. This is a group of folks with tremendous vitality, energy, commitment to hard work, making it out of, out of poverty despite having low levels of education. And it is a tribute to who we are gonna be as the 21st century unfolds. Uh, and here's finally, the last thing I wanna point to is, we, okay, we've been asking how, do, how are other people's views of immigration and, and asking identical questions, exactly the same wording, the same position in the questionnaire, samples drawn the same way in the same three weeks of February, asking uh, people, uh, and then, Checking these, these changes in here between 2010 and 2017, four questions about immigration. Immigrants to, the U, do immigrants to the U.S. today generally contribute more to the American economy than they take, or do they take more than they contribute? The percent saying they contribute more than they take. 40, 49, 59, 63. He said, the U.S., do you think the U.S. should admit more of the same number or fewer legal immigrants in the next 10 years as we admitted in the last 10? The percent saying more or the same number rather than fewer in the last 10 years goes 
like that, 55 to 72. And then we said, well, the, the, the increasing immigration into this country today mostly threaten American culture or mostly strengthen American culture. And the percent saying the new immigration strengthens American culture looks like that. And then finally, we said, uh, are you in favor of post that granting illegal immigrants a path to legal citizenship if they speak English and have no criminal record, as, uh, as uh, you know, Father Donato was reminding us, and, and that looks also like this, with, with moving back and forth, but overwhelming, 70, over 70% 70 of Houstonians said, of course, we need to provide a path to legal citizenship. People are seeing the, the immigrants differently. I think several things are happening. One is a reminder that we have been a nation, a city of immigrants now in, in Houston for 35 years. The first experience of immigrants coming, we've never been a city of immigrants before. In Houston, we're a city of migrants. Immigrants have come here. We've gotten plenty of time to get used to it. We've been, had enormous amounts of time now to recognize how much enriched this city is. With the fiestas and the festivals, Houston is, as many of you know, the rated the, maybe the best place in America to eat out in. Wonderful restaurants that come from, the coming together of cuisines and cultures. Uh, and, and the other key point, I think, is that as Father Nana also said, immigration itself has basically ended in America. There's been no net increase in immigrants in the last five years. As many Mexicans have left the United States to go to Mexico, have left Mexico to come here. The growth of the, Mexi of the, of the Latino and Asian communities in America today are no longer new immigrants. They are the 100% American kids who are the children of the immigrants of 25 and 30 years ago. And that changes dramatically one's whole sense of who these people are and can we get along and we are indeed uh, falling in love with each other and marrying, making multiracial babies. Something like 28% of all married second generation Latinos are married to non-Latinos. Of all the marriages involving an Asian in the last three years, 34% involve a non-Asian. There's been a 600% increase in black-white marriages between 1990 and 2000. We sociologists don't like this. Of course, we want to put people in nice separate categories. <laughs> we, are, we are building a very different world in the, in the 21st century. But the question I want to ask now is, what caused this change? There are two ways that this change can occur. One is by individuals in Houston changing their minds over time about immigrants. And the other is the succession of cohorts, younger folks coming in, becoming adults, moving into the public arena, bringing different views than the older folks who were there before. And we can test that because we've been asking these questions for 30 years. So we can look at the baby boom generation and we can ask, of everybody born between 1946 and 1964, we ask the same questions at four different time periods the mid-90s, early 2000s, mid-late 2000s, and early 2012 to 2017 of, of, of the same baby boom generation uh, and on these four questions. Increasing immigration in this country mostly threatens American culture. Immigrants contribute more to the American economy than they take. Uh, U.S. should admit more of the same number of immigrants in the next 10 years than the last 10. Nothing. No change. Baby boomers today are giving the same responses as they gave 20 years ago. So it isn't a changing of minds. Uh, it, so what it's got to be then is, is this cohort secession. And here's an one piece of, of kind of uh, approach to it. We asked Anglos, of course, like everybody else, have you been involved in a romantic relationship with someone who is not Anglo? And Anglos under 40 or 45 said, uh, thank you for asking. Yes, indeed, I have. I about 50, 55 percent. And here's what it is for us older, older Anglos. I'm, I'm afraid the hearts are going to get a little smaller here. A powerful reminder that we older Anglos grew up in a different world. The world of the 1960s and 70s was simply a different place than the world of the 1990s and 2000s. There's a law of human nature that says, what I am familiar with feels right and natural, what I'm unfamiliar with feels unnatural and somehow not quite right. Every question we ask about comfort with diversity and support for immigration shows this pattern with age or cohort. And here's those same questions now asking of three different cohorts, Folks born in the 1960s, the baby boomers in the 70s, the Gen Xers, and in the 80s, the millennials, uh, all at the age of when they were 25 to 35, we asked those questions, and here are the responses that we got uh, by date of birth, right? Can you see me more? Can you, uh, uh, admit the, more of the same number? Unmistakable, right? Younger generations are coming into the world of adulthood and the public arena with very different than us older folks. They, they simply take for granted what we older Anglos are struggling to accept. And it's not surprising, it's a part of what it means to live at a revolutionary time, a time of fundamental transformation, but it's also a great source of hope and a great sense of where we're heading as a community as we go forward. And 
do not despair of us. Old Anglo is we can change too. It's just more difficult for us than it is for people who are coming of age in a world that they take for granted. But it is a part of this remarkable moment of fundamental transformation. And I applaud what you guys are doing and the work, the work that you're involved with. It, it really has to be shaping not just, again, the Houston future, but a picture of what all of America can do in the 21st century. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Visit the website, check out the reports. I'm finally writing the book. I've signed a contract with Simon & Schuster, a book called Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. And it's really a remarkable, who knew that Houston would be the most interesting and consequential city in the, in the, in the country? Uh, do we have time for questions? I think I've gone over, am I okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm sorry to, I did go over more. It wasn't that much more. Yeah, we're good, okay. Questions, thoughts, comments? Come on down. Dr. Kin, uh, Dr. Steinberg, big fan of your work. Um, I see the definite benefits of showcasing the diversity of Houston and all the other cities within this country, but we had conversations in terms of how metrics for inclusion could also be a good indicator of how healthy a city could be. You know, having different pockets of different groups, but also seeing if they intermingle with each other, if they work with each other, not just from the leadership perspective, but also in the masses. And I saw that you had interracial or interethnic uh, relationships and attitude towards immigration, but are there any other metrics we can broadcast more to showcase how we are working together or if we're not working together? Yes, thank you. We do have a question. I, I have charts I didn't show here, of course. That one that said, do you have a close personal friend who's African-American, a close personal friend who's, who's Asian, a close personal friend who's Latino, a close personal friend who's Anglo, and so we can see what's happening there. And there again, younger folks are much more likely to have close friends that, to be involved in romantic relationships. To, to, but what we are dealing with in Houston and America today, what is the great challenge for the future of this country, is not so much an ethnic divide, it's a class divide. And you see that in every community, a growing middle class and a growing underclass, simultaneously predicated above all else on access to quality education. Why did Donald Trump win this election? Because the one demographic that has suffered the most in America the one demographic whose life expectancy has dropped dramatically in the last 10 years, who's, who are dying from what economists call diseases of despair, suicide, drug addiction, excessive smoking, they are Anglo men with high school educations or less, age 50 and over. And they are the ones who are suffering the most and who are losing the most in this process of, of assimilating a new, a new America and providing people with opportunities to succeed. And that was a big part in those, in those traditionally democratic strongholds. Folks who had never voted before came out just to throw a monkey wrench to the system. Because done when we liberals pay a lot of attention to African Americans and Latinos and, and immigrants, we also need to pay attention to whites who are falling further behind in the, in the rural areas and the smaller cities that are increasingly despairing of, is there a place for me in the America of the 21st century? So we think that's a, a, a very powerful thing to think about as well. Thank you. Thank you. My wife always says, answer the question, don't give another speech. So. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about the, one of the things, the, demogra the, the demographics that you po point out and using the terms uh, Anglo and Latino and black and Asian, and we have a significant population, you just pointed at the very end of, of the younger generation intermarrying across ethnicity and race. Yes. And it's one of those things that uh, it's going to cause a lot of problems with our identifying ourselves. Right. Uh, David Brooks got ca caught a lot of uh, flack when he talked about the demographic change. And I think that, just wanted to ask you, um, how, are, how, how are we going to see this demographic reality? And, and it seems that a lot of that uh, romantic relationship has to do with either uh, two groups, military and uh, higher education. So it's Yes, thank you. That's great. Well, it's one of the reasons why my claim is that the challenge is going to be a, a, a class divide more than an ethnic divide. Ethnicity is going to become less and less relevant and clear as we, as we go forward. Uh, and, and, but it's still there, right? We're still a racist nation. We still may, we, uh, you know, we sociologists are struggling with what will be the new pattern of ethnic relations in, in the 21st century when more and more of us, some of you have already, one third of all American families have somebody in that family close family member who's not of the same ethnicity that they are. 
in the same family, right? It's, so uh, in our surveys, we ask people, are you uh, Anglo, Black, Hispanic, Asian, or some other ethnic background? They say, I'm other ethnic backgrounds. You say, are you, do you think of yourself as closer to, which, which them, uh, ethnic group you consider yourself most closest to? And almost everybody picks one. And it was striking, you know, the census starting in, 19, in 2000 said, choose, check all that apply on the, on the census. And you thought 10%, mo almost all of us have some kind of mixture of ethnicities. Uh, and only 2% check more than one category. We said, okay, well, we just started in 2010, many, many more, 4%. African, you know, uh, Barack Obama, who's 50% white, sees himself and is seen by others as African American. So we're still there, we're still a part of that, but, but you're absolutely right. If you, if, uh, and people yell at me when I say Anglos because of, I'm French, I'm not Anglo, okay? And, <laughs> and the census talks about non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, non-Hispanic Asians, and Hispanics. And it's a, it's a mess. And, and, and it's, and it's going to be, I think, ultimately, where you can choose how important you want to make your ethnicity as a part of your identity, just as people choose today to, am I, to, to claim that they're Italian or Irish, right, in, in ways that will be very interesting to watch, to watch tomorrow. But this has been such a racist nation that it's going to take us a couple of generations to really embrace what is already beginning to happen, I think, in this, this new moment. Other thoughts? Great, thank you all so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you.